welcome everyone to attend today's MBI webinar. So I would like to start our webinar by acknowledging the people from the Kulin nations on whose land Monash University is positioned. I pay my respects to their elders, past and the present. Um, a small housekeeping item before we start our presentation. So please ask your questions for the speaker while the Q&A button. And these questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So the chat section has been disabled, so questions might be sent through the Q&A. Uh, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. We have Professor Jason Matley with us today. Professor Matley is a Laureate Fellow and the Foundation Chair in the Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Queensland. He has won numerous awards, including recently, he was awarded the Di Distinguished Contribution to the Psychological Science Award from the Australian Psychological Society and the Monash University Distinguished Alumni Award. So he was, he was an elected fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2007 and a fellow of Association for Psychological Science in 2016. So he has published numerous papers and books and really a highly cited researcher in the field. So it's a great pleasure to have you today, Jason. Um, without further delay, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to you for your presentation. Looking forward, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jalin, and thank you for the uh, very kind invitation to speak to you today. Um, let me share my screen and maybe you could just confirm. Can you see those slides okay? Uh, yes, I can see it. Perfect. Uh, the, the other way around. But, um, oh, you need the other way. Display. All right. Yeah. Uh, swap displays. <clears throat> Excellent. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, well, like I said, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. Actually, uh, I wish I could be down there at Monash with you all, but I guess uh, these days that's just not possible. So we have to do the next best thing. Um, I thought what I might do just to, to start off uh, would be to tell you a little bit about what I do in my lab. Um, so we're mainly interested in studying the brain basis um, for a whole range of different perceptual and cognitive functions. Um, and I guess the three core topics for us are attention, um, predictive coding and decision making. And I'll talk mostly about the second one of those today. Um, in the work that we do, I guess um, most of the work, 90% of the work is in um, healthy human observers. Um, but increasingly over the last couple of years, we've been uh, moving into using um, mouse models and also non-human primate models in the work that we do. Um, we use a number of different methods in the research uh, that gets run in my lab. So we, we develop um, novel behavioral measures. Um, we use um, non-invasive brain imaging, uh, so EEG and uh, MRI. We also use um, brain stimulation techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, and transcranial electrical uh, current stimulation. Um, wherever possible, we also try and um, develop clinical and translational aspects of the work that we do. So, for example, we've conducted work in patients with um, macular degeneration who have unusual visual, visual hallucinations. Um, I've worked for many years in patients with uh, stroke who have um, chronic attention deficits. More recently, we've been doing work in uh, individuals with callosal dysgenesis, so a disconnection, a developmental disconnection between the two cerebral hemispheres. Um, and just at the moment, we're doing a lot of work developing um, brain computer interfaces and neurofeedback algorithms as well. Uh, and then finally, wherever uh, possible, we try and use and develop uh, modeling approaches to understand the basic um, computations that the brain uses to control behavior. Um, so I've just put three sort of core questions here. These are really the three key areas that we investigate in my lab. Um, so the first one, how are sensory inputs prioritized for goal-directed behavior? That's really about attention, mechanisms of selective attention. Um, how do expectations modulate sensory information processing? So this is the prediction area, and this is what I'm going to focus uh, on in the talk today. Uh, and then finally, how are sensory inputs integrated over time and over space 
uh, in order to guide our thoughts and actions, and this is the area of um, decision making. So these three sort of core areas, but as I said, today I'll talk mostly about um, some recent work we've been doing in uh, this predictive coding uh, area. Uh, I like to sort of highlight these three core functions with an example, just to make it very concrete for people. So, you know, imagine that you're crossing a, a busy road like this one. Um, first, you need to, to pay attention to the, to the relevant inputs, so probably paying attention to the, the cars and the motorbikes that are coming towards you, um, but maybe you uh, can uh, ignore or filter out um, objects that are static, like the buildings and the trees uh, in the background. Um, but you also need to do a little bit of predicting. So uh, in this particular case, it would be advisable to predict the speed and the trajectory of the objects coming towards you, the, the motorbikes and the cars. Uh, and then finally, you need to implement some sort of decision. Uh, so in this case, uh, you need to um, integrate all of the perceived information with your stored knowledge about um, how fast you can walk, uh, maybe your appetite for risk, and so on. Um, so in this talk, what I'd like to do is to um, focus on the concept of prediction, specifically, uh, and its importance in representing different aspects of the world around us. Um, so we're constantly making predictions, either um, consciously or unconsciously, about the state of the world. Um, and that's based on um, current sensory information, uh, as well as about knowledge uh, that we already have um, about how things should be based on our past experiences. And this turns out to be a really uh, efficient way of representing the, the external world. Um, so maybe you could consider this, this concrete example as well. Just think about the information processing load on your visual system as you negotiate your way down a busy street like this one. Um, you have people moving in and out of view, um, you've got vehicles moving in the background, you've got traffic lights changing and so on. Um, so one way that, that the system could reduce the processing load um, would be to store a, a, a model of the external environment and then only to update that model for objects uh, and events that change unexpectedly or in a surprising way. And this is the, the basic idea um, behind this influential model of perception that's called predictive coding theory. Um, and according to predictive coding theory, unexpected or um, surprising things in the environment have a special status because um, they mean that our stored internal model of the world uh, has to get updated in some way. Um, and really, the importance of prediction in perception is exemplified in um, tasks that require really rapid information processing. And I think professional ball sports are a, a sort of classic example of that. So you can think about somebody serving um, a tennis ball. You can look at the sort of speeds that are involved here. Imagine um, a baseball pitcher, you know, throwing the ball at 44 meters a second with the batter standing only 18 meters away. Or in cricket, a fast bowler um, delivering a ball at something like 42 meters per second with the batter standing only 17 meters away. So in all of these cases, um, the receiver, the, the, the batter, uh, has only really a fraction of a second to get their body uh, and their racket or their bat into position in order to intercept the ball. Um, and given that we know there are delays of one to 200 milliseconds between visual inputs uh, getting to the retina and then being transmitted onto higher cortical areas, um, really the only way that a person can make a successful shot under one of these conditions is to predict the trajectory of the ball well in advance. And in fact, um, we're always making predictions about what we see in the world, uh, even though maybe we're not uh, consciously aware of those predictions. So um, I like to use this example. I use this in, in some of my undergraduate lectures as well. If you just look at the, the photograph of the footprints on the left-hand side, um, hopefully they look to you like indentations uh, in the sand. Whereas if you compare that with the, the photo on the right-hand side, um, it should look like these are little sort of footprint-like sculptures that are, are built up out of the sand. But of course, you probably guess that these are in fact identical um, photographs, and that becomes clear when we, when we rotate them. So if we just rotate by 180 degrees, you can see they're actually exactly the same uh, images. And here, 
what the visual system is doing is making a very simple prediction, and that is that um, the source of illumination, which is the sun in this case, typically comes from above. And so it has a particular way of casting a pattern of shadows that suggests that these are indentations uh, in the sand, whereas these are like little sculptures built up out of the sand. So a really strong role of prediction here. Uh, here's a, another example, it's kind of cool example if you haven't seen this before. So, you know, we also make predictions about um, highly familiar stimuli like uh, faces. So based on our um, experience, we assume that faces are convex. So when we view a hollow mask, like the one that you see here, the visual system quickly imposes a predicted organisation uh, on the stimulus. And now what we end up seeing is, is a convex face again. So those examples um, that I've just given really um, suggest that perception is a, a process of active inference where um, current sensory evidence gets weighted against um, prior beliefs in order to produce current perception or what we would call a posterior in, in Bayesian terms. And according to predictive coding theory, predictions uh, get passed up uh, from higher, uh, so get, get passed down rather, from higher to uh, lower areas in the brain. And then prediction errors, uh, which is just, these are just the mismatches between what's expected and, and what's received, get passed back up the hierarchy again to modify stored representations uh, about the state of the world. And it's long been known that these um, prediction errors, these mismatches, produce enhanced responses in the brain relative to expected or, or random stimuli. And this is exemplified in this classic auditory mismatch negativity uh, response, which we can measure using EEG. So here, sequences of, of tones in this sort of simple example, uh, sequences of tones are presented in a kind of uh, repetitive way. So these blue tones, uh, particular frequency are what we call the standards. Uh, and then there's these occasional deviant events, these occasional tones of a different uh, frequency that are interspersed. But these are rare and unexpected. And so they cause a surprise effect. And if we look down below, this is just a classic mismatch uh, response. We're looking at um, changes in electrical potential on the y-axis over time on the x-axis, zero is the onset of a tone, and might be a bit hard to see here, but the dotted, um, the dotted blue line here represents the neural response to standard tones, so these repeating tones in blue. The dotted green line here represents uh, neural responses to the deviant stimulus, the unexpected stimulus, and then this solid red line is the difference wave between these two, between the standards and the deviants. And this is the, the classic sort of mismatch negativity response. Um, so we can ask a question, you know, yes, we see a large neural response to a surprising or an unexpected stimuli, but what does this bigger brain response actually mean? Um, is it the case, for example, that, that surprising uh, stimuli are actually processed any differently from random or completely uh, um, expected stimuli. And that's really going to be the focus of the work that I, I present to you today. So what I'm going to do is take you through um, the results of three uh, sets of studies. Uh, the first study is a, an EEG um, imaging study in, in normal healthy human observers. And this is the key question that we, we sought to address. Are elementary features of sensory events encoded any differently for predicted relative to unpredicted or surprising stimuli? Um, then I'll uh, present a second study, again using EEG, asking this question whether prediction errors that occur in one sensory modality affect neural encoding of elementary features in an entirely separate modality. So that's a study where we um, create a set of expectations in audition, but we test the impact of that on the processing of concurrent visual stimuli. Uh, and then in, a, in the third uh, study, I'm going to turn my attention to uh, some recent work we've been doing looking at um, the responses of individual neurons in mouse primary visual cortex using calcium imaging. And here we're asking um, what are the effects of prediction errors on coding of uh, elementary features at the level of single neurons.
So let's um, start with this first study, um, uh, EEG study in humans. And when we consider the role of prediction or expectation in, in sensory processing, it's really important to control for um, the well-known effects of uh, stimulus habituation or what's sometimes called repetition suppression in fMRI studies. And this is what happens when a target is preceded by an identical stimulus and um, the neuronal response is, is attenuated. So this is a nice example from a study by um, Sayers and colleagues. It's an fMRI study in humans. And what you can see is that they presented their subjects in the scanner with pairs of familiar visual images. And these pairs were either repeats, as you see above, or they were non-repeats, as you see below. The target images are these two on the right-hand side, and you can see they're identical. The only difference is the history. So in one case, the target's been preceded by an identical stimulus. In the non-repeat case, the target's been preceded by something different. And if you look on the right-hand side, this is the bold response measured with fMRI in, in human subjects. Um, and this is the response uh, measured in the lateral occipital cortex. That's this little area in yellow that you see here in the occipital lobe. Um, area LO is, contains neurons that um, are tuned to complex uh, object features. Uh, and hopefully what you can see here is that um, the neural response, the bold response, is much lower in the repeated category than in the non-repeated category. So these are identical stimuli, but just because of um, the stimulus history, if there's been a repetition of an item, you can see there's an attenuated or reduced neural response. Um, and it's important that we take this into account because if we just go back to that mismatch negativity result I talked about before, it might turn out that um, mismatch responses are in fact due to some kind of attenuation uh, of expected stimuli rather than enhancement of the unexpected oddball events. So in any design where we look at the effects of prediction on sensory processing, it's important to sort of control for or pull apart prediction effects from repetition suppression effects. So in this um, first experiment that uh, I want to tell you about, um, we used EEG to measure neural responses to orientation information carried by um, these simple black and white grating stimuli. And um, we chose orientation, the feature of orientation, for two reasons. First, um, we know that neurons in the primary visual cortex are tuned to this simple feature. Uh, and second, because we know that we can decode orientation selective responses from human EEG data, as I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So the key question in this uh, experiment was whether orientation tuning is altered for gratings that uh, are unexpected relative to gratings that are expected. So let me just um, walk you through the, the basic design. We presented these grating stimuli in pairs, as you see here. Each grating appeared for 100 milliseconds, separated by a, a half second blank interval. And um, we organized the presentation of these pairs of stimuli in two different types of blocks. So in one type of block, which we call repeating, um, the same orientation was presented twice, and that occurred on 80% of all pairs within the block. Whereas there was an alternation, the second grating was different in its orientation from the first in 20% of trials within these repeating blocks. And so if you think about this from the point of view of the subject, what, what's expected here is that there'll be a repetition of the two orientations, because that's what happens on 80% of trials in the block. And only on 20% of trials is there a difference in the orientation, an alternation. Uh, and so uh, the expected and unexpected events here are manipulated according to these probabilities. We then have these alternating blocks, exactly the same stimuli again, but with different probabilities. So now the likelihood that there'll be two different orientations within a pair is 80%. And the likelihood that there'll be a repetition of the orientation in a pair is only 20%. So what people come to expect in these alternating blocks is that the orientation will change, and what's unexpected is that the, alternation, uh, uh, that the orientation will stay the same. So you can see that we've effectively controlled for or pulled apart the factors of expectation on the one hand from um, repetition, suppression, or habituation on the other.
So subjects are doing this task, they're seeing lots and lots of these pairs, in fact many thousands of trials over several EEG sessions, uh, and their task is actually very simple. They're just looking for a, a, an occasional grating stimulus that's coloured, but otherwise they have no other task to do but to look at these um, pairs of gratings on the screen. Um, and then what we want to do here is to quantify this featural information. We want to quantify orientation selectivity. Um, and we want to do that for the second grating in each of those pairs. And to do this we use um, a population tuning curve approach that's known as forward encoding modelling, or sometimes you'll hear it um, described as inverted encoding. And so um, in this procedure what we do is we start off with a, a, a set of basis functions that represent the feature of interest. So in this case um, it's representing the feature of grating orientation, so we have these 16 um, tuning curves here. Um, and then what we do is we take a subset of the um, EEG data that we obtain from each participant uh, and we use this as a training set. And then for all trials what we do is um, compute uh, vectors of the channel responses to the second grating in each pair. And the vectors of these responses um, then get related back to the, to the EEG data, this training EEG data set, in order to construct a weight matrix. And then in a, a second stage of the analysis we take um, a, a left out testing set of EEG data um, and we multiply these by the inverted weight matrix that we obtained in the first stage. Um, and this transforms the EEG data into uh, channel responses. And the idea is, if everything works as it should, that the vectors of these channel responses should um, yield a peak in, in response that's close to the presented grating orientation. So let's have a look at the, the data from uh, this, uh, this study. So these are um, group results from uh, 20 participants doing the task that I've just described. Um, if you look at the panel on the left hand side, this is showing orientation tuning collapsed across all the experimental conditions. So on the um, x-axis, uh, this is the um, orientation of the grating that's presented. So zero would be the actual orientation that was presented uh, for the second grating in that trial. And then on the y-axis, this is time. So zero here represents the onset of the second grating in each pair. Um, and hopefully what you can see here is that there's a larger channel response that, that emerges here starting at around about um, 50 to 70 milliseconds after the onset of the second grating. And you can see it continues uh, all the way through for around about 450 milliseconds. And then on the right hand side here, these um, fitted Gaussians just represent tuning at, uh, across two different time points from this panel on the left hand side. So if you look at the blue um, curve here, this is tuning to orientation between 50 and 100 milliseconds after the onset of that second grating. And the red curve here represents tuning between 150 uh, and 200 milliseconds, so around about here. And you can see there's this gradual increase in the gain of the tuning response to the orientation of the second grating uh, over time. And we can sort of quantify the magnitude of this um, tuning function, if you like, and that's what I'm showing you here in panel C. So on the y-axis is um, orientation selectivity, so the peakiness of these Gaussians here over time in a single trial. Zero again is the onset of the second grading in the trial. And you can see that very quickly, after about 50 milliseconds from the onset of the grating, we see significant orientation um, decoding, and that that continues uh, for nearly half a second within the trial. Uh, on the right-hand side here, these um, head maps just show the regression weights for the two time periods in these Gaussians that I've shown you on the left-hand side. And if you look at this period here between 150 and 250 milliseconds, which corresponds to this red Gaussian function here, you can see that the, the strongest, or the largest regression weights uh, for the, the um, feature tuning uh, sit here over the occipital cortex, which is exactly what we would expect given that this is a, a visual task and we're presenting uh, our subjects with visual stimuli. So what we can now do is um, compare orientation uh, selectivity as a function of the two different block types that we presented. So this plot at the top here just shows um, significant orientation tuning that 
really was equivalent for um, the repeated and the alternating trials. So you can see the red plot here corresponds to the alternating blocks, the blue plot corresponds to the repeating blocks, uh, and so you can see although we get significant orientation tuning, that's what's represented on the y-axis here, there's no difference between the two conditions. So in fact we don't really see uh, any evidence for a repetition suppression or habituation effect in this particular paradigm. But what's more important and more interesting from our point of view is that we do see uh, a significant effect of expectation or prediction. Uh, so again, if you look here, you can see that we get significant orientation tuning to the second grating in each pair, but that tuning is significantly larger for the unexpected or the unpredicted stimulus compared with the expected one. And if we just look at this period where there's a significant difference down here and plot um, the, the Gaussians for those for the tuning at those uh, over that time period, you can see here uh, a larger, a higher gain of the response to unexpected gratings compared with expected gratings. So the important point to bear in mind here is that we've completely matched all of the physical properties of the stimuli. They're all centered on the presented orientation here, which is zero. The only difference is the stimulus history, whether a particular grating happened to be expected or unexpected. And we see uh, a, a significant difference here in the tuning function under those two conditions. So after finding these results, one of the things that we were interested in doing was asking, well, if we can see reliable effects of prediction on feature tuning within a single sensory modality, to what extent might there be interactions between two or more sensory modalities? Uh, and so what I want to do now is describe to you an experiment we ran, which is very similar in its flavor to that first study I just described, but now where we look at feature encoding of orientation, but where the uh, surprising or unexpected stimuli um, are created through the auditory modality. So we're going to look at setting up uh, an auditory oddball paradigm and looking at the effects of the onsets of those oddball stimuli, those oddball auditory events, on encoding of um, visual orientation. So this is the, the basic setup. If you just look at the top left, this is um, a kind of uh, snapshot of what the displays looked like for our subjects. We had 28 healthy human participants do this task, again recording um, brain activity using EEG. And we showed them displays that had this sort of annular shape to them. So you can see, again, we're looking at these oriented visual gratings. But now it's a sort of annular uh, uh, design. So there's a sort of hole in the middle, a bit like a donut. And that's because we have a little loudspeaker sitting in the middle of the screen here. And that little loudspeaker is going to play tones during the task, which can um, generate either predicted or unpredicted sounds. And so in the basic task, what we have our participants do is monitor these grating stimuli that are changing in their orientation. Each one just appears for 50 milliseconds, then there's a noise interval for 100 milliseconds, just blank noise, then another grating, and so on. So these things run through in lengthy streams. And actually what the subject's doing is, again, just looking for an occasional uh, target stimulus, and the target stimulus here is a higher spatial frequency. So you can see these thinner stripes relative to the more frequent thick stripes that we get you know, for the, the target stimuli. So while subjects are doing uh, are passively viewing these, these visual gratings, we're also presenting them with streams of tones. Uh, and essentially in this design what we have is a high frequency tone at 4.7 kilohertz and a low frequency tone at, at 3.7 kilohertz. Each tone uh, occurs for 100 milliseconds and separated by 600 millisecond gap. And you can see here, this is what's sometimes called a roving oddball paradigm. So you get a, a certain number of repeats of a standard stimulus here. In this case, it's the high frequency tone. And then there's a change to the other frequency. So this first stimulus after the change is what we would call the oddball because it's unexpected. Then there's a, a variable number of repetitions of, in this case, the lower frequency tone, a minimum of four, but it could extend up to nine. And then there's another change unexpectedly. So now this, this change to the uh, higher frequency tone, this is another oddball event here. And so if you think about this, what we're really interested in doing is asking, to what extent will we see changes in the 
tuning to the orientation of these visual gratings when the onset of the gratings occur around the time of an oddball stimulus compared with if they occur sometime during the presentation of a standard auditory stimulus. And so this is sort of a schematic of the, the setup. You can see the gratings are being presented fairly frequently here. And these are the oddball tones, uh, uh, sorry, these are the um, tones in the auditory stream, some of which will be oddballs and some of which will be standards. And what we can ask is, if a grating stimulus occurs close in time to an oddball auditory stimulus, do we see a change in its tuning compared with a grating perhaps that occurs in association with a standard auditory stimulus? And so when we run this task, we have both these audio-visual type blocks that I've just described. We also have interleaved blocks of trials where we just have people do the visual task so that we can get a kind of baseline measure of tuning to this orientation property without um, the additional auditory stimulus information. So the first thing we, we want to do in this study is to verify that we get an oddball response from the auditory stimuli, from this roving oddball paradigm, and we get a really nice uh, oddball response. So what you're seeing here is the, um, the evoked potential, the ERP, to the onset of each tone in the sequence. I'm showing you the ERPs from the central electrodes um, at homologous locations uh, on the scalp across over the two hemispheres. The um, purple line here represents uh, the average evoked response to standard stimuli and the green uh, function here represents the average response to all of the oddball events. Uh, and you can see already here this divergence at about 150 milliseconds. We get this really nice uh, mismatch negativity, this mismatch response to oddball stimuli. So first sanity check we can tick off. We are seeing an oddball response in the auditory stimuli. But really what we want to know is what happens to the visual stimuli that are being uh, presented at the same time. Uh, so remember I told you that for every sound in the sequence there are four gratings just because of the, the difference in the rate at which we're presenting the auditory and the visual stimuli. So if you just have a look in this lower left hand corner, this is um, it's, it's like a dissimilar, dissimilarity matrix. It's actually calculated using something called the Mahalanobis distance, um, which is a bit like the inverted encoding um, tuning response that I told you about in the first experiment. The details don't matter too much. What's important to note is that what I'm showing you here is um, zero is the onset of each uh, visual grating in the sequence. So from uh, zero out to 150 milliseconds here. And then on the y-axis, this is just the tuning. So zero is the presented orientation, and you can see the range goes from minus pi to, to plus pi. And the color coding here represents the degree of orientation tuning expressed as this similarity metric. So you can see that at about well, maybe 80 milliseconds after the onset of the grating, you can see that we get nice orientation um, tuning here to, to that grating. And if we look at each successive grating after the, um, uh, along the course of the trial, you can see again we get nice uh, orientation tuning. What I'm showing you in this lower row is the orientation selective response in the absence of any sounds. But we see very similar responses when we look at the blocks where there's uh, an auditory stimulus playing at the same time. And these tuning functions in this second row are for cases where the gratings appeared after a standard tone, so an expected tone. And this top row here represents orientation tuning again, but now associated with the onset of an oddball auditory stimulus. So if we just look at the data like this, we can see nice orientation tuning, but it's actually very difficult to discern whether there's actually a difference in the magnitude of the tuning for particularly these oddball versus standard uh, cases. And so to do that, we need to do a, a direct comparison between them. So if you have a look at the top right corner, I've just taken, maybe if I go back again, I'm just going to take one of these panels. So I've taken one of these uh, orientation uh, coding uh, patterns or, or matrices, and I'm just going to um, I'm going to rotate it so now we've got orientation on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. So this is the center of the tuning curve. You can imagine if you drew a line through here, you could plot a nice Gaussian function. Uh, and we're just going to 
um, sum all of the tuning between 100 and 150 milliseconds after the onset of the grating. And we're going to do that at different points in time relative to this uh, oddball uh, effect that we uh, measured in the auditory ERPs. So what you're seeing down here is uh, this familiar Gaussian tuning curve. So we get that by just summating activity across this time window, 100 and 150 milliseconds after the onset of the grating. And you can see if we just look at this time point here, it's between 70 and 120 milliseconds after the onset of one of the tones. You can see that the visual tuning to orientation is pretty similar for the oddball and the standard sound case. So in other words, it doesn't really matter much whether there was an oddball sound or a standard sound presented at this point in time. We see roughly equivalent visual orientation tuning. Uh, and in fact, the pattern looks very similar if we take two further time slices across this mismatch effect here. You can see again, nice orientation tuning between 220 and 270 milliseconds. Nice orientation tuning again between 370 and 420 milliseconds but no difference between oddballs and standards. But then when we get to 520 to 570 milliseconds after the onset of the tone, we now see a difference in visual tuning emerge. Specifically, what we see is that we get a higher gain in the orientation selective response when that visual grating was presented around the same time as an oddball stimulus compared with a standard stimulus. So you see this difference uh, here. So in other words, about half a second after the onset of an unexpected auditory stimulus, we see an enhancement in the gain response to the orientation of a completely unrelated visual stimulus, uh, compared with when that same stimulus is presented, but in association with a standard auditory event. So if you just think back to the results of that first experiment, we found an expectation or a prediction effect that emerged about 80 milliseconds after the onset of the grating. But of course, that was a case where the expectation was developed within the visual modality. Here, what we're showing is a similar kind of expectancy effect or prediction effect for the visual stimulus. But in this case, it's happening much later. And it's happening in association with a, a, a surprising event in an entirely unrelated modality. So in this case, in audition. So we can show that these expectation effects the impact that they have on feature tuning can cross between one sensory modality and another, albeit at a much slower, later uh, time course in this, in this particular instance. OK, how am I doing for time? Uh, looks like we're on time so far. So in, in the third study that I'd like to talk about um, today, I'd like to turn to um, some recent work we've been doing looking at the responses of individual neurons in the visual cortex. So the first two studies, I've talked about whole brain activity and trying to decode feature selective information from EEG. But of course, it would be nice to know what's happening in terms of um, predictions and prediction errors at the level of individual neurons. And so um, this is some work that we've been doing recently using um, calcium imaging, two-photon calcium imaging in mice, awake mice, to look at the effects of prediction on orientation uh, tuning. So uh, in this study, we use um, awake head-fixed mice. Uh, and as I said, we're using um, calcium imaging, GCAP6F. And we show the mice um, these grating patterns, very similar to the ones that we use in our human studies. Uh, and we show these uh, grating stimuli in two different patterns. So if you look at the random pattern first, you can see that these gratings are changing in orientation. They change every um, 250 milliseconds, so four changes per second here. And compare that with uh, this rotating sequence. So they're the same grating stimuli again, but now you can see that with each new display, the orientation rotates by 30 degrees. So you can imagine looking at this directly on, on the fovea, you see the gratings kind of rotating on the spot. And so if you look at this uh, sequence here, what you would actually expect in this final frame would be a vertical grating. But in fact, what's presented at this particular point is a horizontal grating. So this is a, a violation of expectation. This is a surprising stimulus. But what's kind of cool here is that for every sequence of rotating gratings and random gratings, we can just pick pairs 
that are identical in their orientation. So here we've got two horizontal gratings, but the history is different. In one case, there's, there's no information about what the next stimulus will be, so there can be no surprise. But in this rotating sequence, this horizontal grating represents a violation of expectation. And so we can ask, to what extent do uh, individual neurons in, in mouse visual cortex change the way that they respond, what's their orientation selective response to these two stimuli when the stimuli are unexpected versus uh, random. So very much the same question that we ask in our human subjects. So here are some um, data from this study. Uh, on the left hand side this is just an example field of view. I've highlighted um, eight different neurons in visual cortex. These are data from five mice across 23 recording sessions. Uh, and then in the center here, I'm just showing you the, um, the neural responses um, expressed as um, delta F over F. So this is just the fluorescence value for each of the neurons um, as a function of the orientation of the grating that's being presented. So if you look along the top here, we've got the different grating orientations. And down this way, we've got eight different neurons as highlighted in the field of view here. And you can see that all of these neurons have some degree of orientation tuning. So maybe we could pick a couple of examples. Let's look at uh, neuron um, five. So this neuron here, you can see it has a strong preference for vertical uh, orientations. Um, uh, likewise, so does neuron uh, eight here, a strong preference for vertical. We can look at uh, some other neurons, maybe number six here. It's got a strong preference for horizontal. So all of these neurons show um, nice orientation tuning. And what we want to know is whether that orientation response is going to be different for random versus um, unexpected or surprising presentations. So here I'm just showing you some example data, but now separated by condition. So in blue, these blue functions represent random presentations, and the green ones represent unexpected or surprising presentations of each of these grating stimuli. These are three example neurons here, but let's just focus on the population response. So these are data from 463 um, neurons recorded over the, the five animals. Uh, and along uh, here, what we've done is just to organize the responses as if the presented orientation was always vertical. And you can kind of see here already that there's a, a much larger neural response to uh, an unexpected stimulus than to a random stimulus shown here in blue. And this is probably easier uh, to see if we just look at the um, Gaussian fits to the tuning. So th these are tuning curves here um, looking at orientation selectivity and you can see that there's a, a much larger response, a higher gain response uh, for the unexpected uh, presentations compared with the, the random presentations. And this just shows these, um, these uh, matrices here just show every individual neuron. You can see the sort of enhanced response when uh, the stimulus was presented unexpectedly compared with uh, randomly for all 463 uh, neurons. Um, just another way of looking at the same data, so what I'm showing you on the left hand side here, uh, each little dot is an individual neuron, uh, and what we're showing here is the response of each neuron to an unexpected um, grating stimulus um, as a function of its response to the same stimulus but presented in a random sequence. And all of the red dots here represent neurons that uh, show a significant modulation, uh, a significantly increased uh, orientation selective response to an unexpected stimulus compared with a random stimulus. And so roughly a third of all neurons show this um, modulation by prediction. In the center here, this panel just shows uh, decoding of the orientation selective response for um, unexpected stimuli compared with the random presentations. You can see it emerges here at about 300 to 400 milliseconds after the stimulus onset. Uh, and then on the right hand side here, these are just um, the summary statistics for fitted Gaussian um, parameters for the whole population. And you can see here this large increase in the gain of the orientation selective response for unexpected presentations. Interestingly, no change in the width of the fitted Gaussian. It's purely a, a gain uh, change that we see here. Uh, and then finally, just in the last 30 seconds, we uh, have also run these same sequences in mice, but in mice that are anesthetized. And 
Um, there are a number of reasons for being interested in the comparison between awake and anaesthetized animals in this case. Um, many of you will know that even in human patients who are anaesthetized or in a coma, um, you can measure a, an oddball response, a sort of expectancy or prediction error response. And we wondered whether it might be true also in, um, in the mouse model, and particularly for this orientation tuning effect that we've been, um, we've been looking at. So um, we have a number of animals that are now anaesthetized, 270 neurons that we have data for here. And at the top, this, these are the random presentations. You can see um, a nice orientation tuning response um, to, to each grating. But you compare the magnitude of that response on the y-axis with what happens when those same stimuli are presented, but where there's a violation of expectation of the kind that I've been talking about. And probably down here is the easiest way to see that effect. Again, you can see this real, um, really large increase in the gain of the orientation selective response to uh, unexpected grating stimuli um, when the animal's anaesthetized. And if you just look at panel E in the lower right hand corner, this just shows the surprise effect, which is the difference between the um, unexpected and the random presentations uh, for the awake animal here and for the anaesthetized animals here. And you can see that there's a, a really robust um, surprise effect for, for both. It's, it's somewhat diminished in magnitude in the anaesthetized animals, but still um, uh, significantly different from zero. So we still see a prediction error effect on orientation tuning in animals that are anaesthetized. So um, I should probably uh, wrap up at this point. Uh, let me just draw three conclusions from those three studies that I presented. The first one, the EEG study um, looking at visual responses shows that the amplitude or, or gain of feature-specific neural responses is increased for surprising relative to predicted stimuli. That second study, uh, human study I presented with EEG, uh, shows that prediction errors in one sensory modality, in this case in the auditory modality, exert an effect, albeit a rather late effect, on feature-selective neural responses to uh, concurrent visual stimuli. Uh, and then that third study that I described uh, in uh, mouse visual cortex, what we're able to show is that in uh, individual neurons we see an increase in the gain of neural responses in uh, uh, orientation selective neurons for unpredicted relative to um, random visual stimuli. And uh, I should acknowledge the, the contributions of a number of people who have um, contributed to this, this work. Uh, Matt Tang uh, was a postdoc in my lab uh, when he conducted that first visual EEG experiment. He's now working together with me and Asana Rabsida on the uh, mouse calcium imaging experiments. Uh, and also Dragan Rangelov, who's a postdoc in my lab, is, uh, has uh, been running experiments on these cross-modal prediction effects and specifically that audio-visual effect that I described uh, during the talk. Um, and with that I'll end and uh, very, be very happy to answer any questions people might have. Great, excellent Jason. That's really uh, insightful and a nice presentation. So now we are slightly behind schedule but perhaps we have a um, few minutes for questions. Uh, there's a question uh, regarding the suppression of response to preferred orientations seem to contribute to the sharpening of the orientation selectively. Is this suppression a necessary consequence of the response increase to preferred stimuli? Right, let me, I'm just opening the chat box here. Suppression of response to unpreferred orientation seems to contribute to sharpening of orientation. Is this suppression necessary consequence of response increase to preferred? Yeah, um, so maybe I can ask this person, are you referring to the results um, from the mouse calcium imaging specifically with the, the rotating sequences? Um, if so, the results there are kind of interesting because um, the, you know, in that experiment, there's a, there's a clear history that unfolds over time with the rotating stimuli. And that in itself, I think, does impact orientation selectivity um, for, the, for the unexpected events. And that's why, rather than comparing predicted and unpredicted in that mouse calcium imaging experiment, we compare random with unpredicted stimuli. Because the predicted events are, are a kind of case in and of themselves, just because of the stimulus history. So um, the 
I will, I will allow the uh, the person ask question to speak. Oh, hi, Jason. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for a really excellent talk. Um, I love the the focus on experiment design uh, through this. Um, uh, I had another question, maybe a little bit of a follow up to the the previous one um, with the the rotating uh, and random conditions in the calcium imaging. Hmm. Uh, it seems that um, I mean the effects look really close to what we see with human EEG with surprise, this boosting of, of orientation selectivity and things like that. But um, one of the small, I guess, tidbits about this is that um, in addition to repetition suppression, we do have that. Um, uh, the broader phenomenon of adaptation where, you know, the, the orientation difference between two successive um, gabors or gradings does tend to, um, you know, uh, influence the signal in a fairly systematic way. So, you know, the further the orientation between two successive gradings, yep. the um, larger the response tends to be. I was wondering um, if you'd also done a, a similar analysis and sort of did one back matching between the random and the um, uh, unexpected stimuli to yep. maybe be able to partial out a bit of this and, and better isolate the surprise response. Yep, yep, great question. Thanks, Dan. We've done exactly that. Um, so importantly in the design, we make sure that on average across the trials, the magnitude of the orientation change for the event that we're encoding um, is identical for the random sequence and for the um, for the unexpected event in the predictable sequence, if you know what I mean. So in other words, we're keeping the absolute difference between the n minus one grating and the n grating the same. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Sorry if I missed that in your talk. No, that's all right. I don't think I told you that. So that's a good question. And, and we we thought about it and, and we dealt with it. I notice Hinza has got a little uh, question here about it's unusual to see such a late response um, in the calcium imaging data, you know, that it really four to five hundred milliseconds um, after the onset of, of the grating stimulus. We were well, I was also a bit surprised at how slow that was. And I don't know why it is the two speculations I have first you know, calcium imaging, it's a bit like bold responses. It's a bit sluggish. And what we would really like is individual unit responses. And we're running experiments at the moment with um, electrodes, implanted electrodes to get better temporal information about these prediction effects. So good question. Um, and you speculate, you know, maybe it's because vision isn't their primary sense. Um, maybe, you know, may, maybe if we recorded from barrel cortex, um, we would see uh, a shorter lived effect or um, temporally more precise effects and actually barrel cortex is one area where we're doing the electrophysiology at the moment. So I can get back to you about that in a few months time, I hope. Great, excellent. Um, there's two more questions. There's a one in the audience raising hand, but this, uh, this one in uh, Q&A, uh, Jason. So um, thanks for your talk, Jason. With the mouse results, selectivity seems to emerge for late greater than 500 milliseconds. Can you speculate why this is so late? It is um, because of... Um, yeah, using, so, yeah, so I think I might have just, or at least attempted to answer that question of Hinz's. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, I think that was my last answer. Okay. Thanks. There's a question from the, um, from the audience, so just... Can you ask your question? Okay. Um, I don't think we get that. Um, anyway, so I guess we, we're running over time and um, it's better to wrap up now. Thanks again, Jason, for your excellent, excellent talk today and a very insightful and useful discussion. Um, so Thank, thank everyone to attend today's seminar. Um, so I will see you next time and um, hope you enjoy the presentation today. And I think the, the seminar will be also made available online. Jason, is that correct? Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. See you next time.